Welcome back to another punk dropping and bar hopping episode of What Happened, the investigative YouTube style pop culture media show that is a 100% confirmed card carrying resident of Dog Street. This week, we'll be taking a look at one of the first hyped games for Sony's mighty PlayStation Double Ballin', and which also represented Square's first effort in delivering more cinematic movie-style games, complete with lifelike, stirring performances. Hey, where were you? You're late. Well, um... <laughs> But what was once considered the 6th gen juggernaut's earliest killer app, unfortunately didn't quite become the industry changing hit Square had hoped it would be. And today I'll be getting into the dirt and grime as to why. So strap on your chains, studs, buckles, laces, chokers, and belts as I answer the question what happened to The Bouncer? Now, I think it would benefit us all if I properly set the table here, because the time frame I'm going to be taking you back to is uh, quite different from today. Squaresoft were on the top of the video game industry in 1999, coming off a massively successful string of back-to-back -back RPG blockbusters, not to mention other great titles like Parasite Eve, Vagrant Story, and Brave Fencer Musashi. Wanting to keep the momentum of this runaway freight train going, Square then greenlit three projects for Sony's forthcoming console, the aforementioned PlayStation 2. With industry rumors claiming this trio of new games encompassed a new Final Fantasy, a fighting game, and a mysterious third title. Our interest, of course, lies in the fighting game, which for a good amount of time was heavily rumored to be a sequel to... No, please, no, please don't! Uh, that game's developer, Dream Factory, were the ones Square were reportedly teaming with on this new fighting game, and it is a studio I think many of you might be passingly familiar with. It was founded in late 1995 by Seiichi Ishii, who had previously been lead designer on Virtua Fighter and had done a ton of work building the fundamentals that 3D fighting games rely on to this very day. It should be no surprise then that he did the same for Tekken, designing and directing the first two entries, before striking out on his own with Dream Factory, which very quickly entered a publishing deal with Square. Under this new partnership, Ishii wound up directing Tobal number one, two, and... Uh, uh, it then follows that Ishii would be the natural choice to also serve as the director for this new PS2 fighting game project, but instead of a sequel, it was going to be an all new IP, and this time it would be a far more collaborative project. This was due to the fact that Ishii would have to share directing duties with Square's own Takashi Tokita, who any RPG fan should be familiar with, but in case you're not, he directed both Parasite Eve and Chrono Trigger, along with working on a ton of other Square classics. And finally, if it wasn't immediately the most obvious thing in recorded history, Tetsuyo Nomura was given the role of the main character designer. The first footage of the project was shown at the Spring 1999 Tokyo Game Show, with an extended cut getting a more public debut that August at the SIGGRAPH convention, which was held in Los Angeles. This clip contained noticeably different elements than what was seen in the final game, as it focused on two men and a woman battling a gang of ninjas. Previews from the time, such as the one written by IGN, likened the tone and fight choreography to a John Woo film, and if you can see past the 1999 off-screen fuzz, it wasn't too far from that. It should be noted though that despite IGN and other outlets labeling the project as Urgeis 2, Square had not given it an official title yet, and it was actually MagicBox.com, <laughs> that takes me back, that were the first to report this actually wasn't a sequel to anything, but instead a brand new all original adventure. Later that September, at the second TGS show of the year, a similar but more elaborate trailer showed off even more scenes that were, again, not included in the final game, as well as several that were, just with tweaked character designs and shot at completely different angles. 
To be fair though, much of this doesn't seem to be actual gameplay, but rather in-engine cutscenes meant to represent what the team were shooting for when it came to specific action sequences. Many of these scenes featured lots of interaction with the backgrounds, with characters getting smashed through barriers into chairs and tables, and even using said tables to gain an advantage. It's also interesting that the female character, in this case Dominique, seems to have been playable in the main story mode at some some point, but her inclusion, along with the impressive amount of stage destruction, were both evidently cut out over the next year of development. The actual name for the game was also finalized. The Bouncer! Uh, yes, thank you. By Sony earlier that month, but even after that, IGN still claimed that this was the unofficial sequel to Urguys, which, of course, was wrong. This early confusion of what the game was, coupled with showing off footage which contained features that would not be seen in the final version, marked the start of a problematic pattern with the bouncer, and was one that it would never really be able to shake. The press were generally blown away by what they were seeing in these trailers, with hype generating nice and early due to the game's visuals and character models. There were still a lot of unknowns though. Square were reportedly not talking about any multiplayer elements at all, but they did confirm that the main story mode would be single player only, and that they couldn't yet commit to a release date, or even whether it was going to be a launch title for the PS2. That last point was always a little vague, but through my digging, it seems it was either implied or at least the plan for a little while, but Square were always a bit non-committal in regards to it. Going with that same theme, after the fall 1999 TGS show, Square suddenly stopped talking about the bouncer for months on end, which led some in the press to assume the team were running into problems getting the game running on actual PS2 hardware. This was confirmed somewhat later on in September of 2000 in a series of articles that were issued by Square to media outlets, and contained prepared questions and answers about the bouncer. In them, Tokita admitted that, The hardest part was definitely working with the PS2 for the first time. Also, working with the large capacity media DVD was a new thing. The burden on the programmers has become heavier, so adjusting the schedule was the biggest obstacle. IGN then got a little uncharacteristically sassy with their own question, which is why there had been such a dearth of media or details on the bouncer for the last few months, and if that was indicative of any other issues the development had run into. Tokita dodged this outright, saying that he felt confident in the bouncer's visual quality and that they were taking the utmost care to reduce load times. IGN's question was probably in regards to the fact that year's E3 hadn't provided any new details, and that the game still wasn't made playable for the press, and in fact, never would be up until its official release. This understandably frustrated outlets who were keen to go hands-on with the bouncer, considering it was the PS2's best-looking, yet most mysterious game. All they could do was analyze the footage provided, and several took note that Square's narrative beat-em-up RPG hybrid thing seemed to lean very heavily on cutscenes and not much else, with fighting sequences often only lasting for 30 seconds or less. Hey, look, it, it's fine to last only 30 seconds or less, as long as you make that 30 seconds exciting, let me tell ya. And now it's here where we have to go back to the cut content I mentioned earlier, and the reasons behind it. Early on, the PS2 had quickly gained a reputation for being difficult to work with, judging by both Tokita's comments and echoed by other developers in the stories I've covered before. This technical issue, combined with the pressure to get a big system seller out for the PS2's North American launch, certainly must have contributed to features and characters getting scaled back to at least get within that short launch window. Due to this, both Square and Dream Factory are most likely scrambling to get things finished up, but then Square suddenly announced that Sion, Volt, and Co. were going to bounce into store shelves simultaneously in Japan and North America at the very tail end of 2000. Now, a simultaneous release was something of an incredible world-ending rarity when talking about classic Squaresoft, and this case was no different, given what would happen later. 
things then came to a head in an IGN Off the Record article, where the website claimed Dream Factory were running into problems getting the bouncer out the door. If you recently have been wondering about the once hugely hyped and earliest of PlayStation 2 games, The Bouncer, you certainly aren't alone. Square's <laughs> Uber Fighter, the game that appeared to break free of the decaying fighting game paradigm with its story-driven gameplay and interactive narrative, has been out of sight for some time now. Square hasn't canceled the game by any means, but apparently the development team at Dream Factory is reportedly having to pace itself up the long, steep development road that the PS2 has earned a reputation for in its short existence. They finished this rumor off by saying the bouncer was now being pushed to January 2001, and it's funny how they were both right and wrong about this for completely different reasons. The Japanese version did make it out before the end of the year, December 23rd to be precise, but the Western version was indeed pushed to January, which honestly wasn't a big deal until it was. The initial launch of the PS2 didn't go as well as Sony were hoping, as it lacked big marquee titles to really push sales, so in conjunction with an initiative Sony had already been doing for a few years where they would help third-party publishers to push upcoming titles, March 2001 was being positioned as a soft relaunch of the console. This would bring a new wave of advertising with Sony pouring their own marketing money into third-party efforts, with the North American version of the Bouncer being one of those titles. This meant it would now release in March, even though it was completely finished, and while this would be annoying to those who had been anticipating it, the flip side was that it could now take advantage of all the new marketing dollar dollars, but in reality, it would actually wind up having the opposite effect. Uh, allow me to explain. With the Bouncer being such a mysterious yet anticipated game, pretty much every major outlet imported the Japanese version and did various hands-on previews, which uh, revealed a lot about the experience gamers could expect. While everyone praised the game's visual effects, short load times, and the near-seamless integration of cutscenes, reviewers were also frank about the huge gulf between actual gameplay and those cutscenes. Its wonky XP system, its lack of two-player co-op, its problematic camera, and the game's fractured narrative, which could only be pieced together adequately by completing the game multiple times while having to play through many of the same levels. So by the time the game was released in North America on March 6th, both magazines and online outlets had inundated fans with two months worth of mixed reviews. And with the PS2 being heralded as a quantum leap for video games at the time and the bouncer being an important part of that first year, it must have been deflating for some fans to read things like, the Bouncer is extremely light on gameplay. In fact, skipping through every cinema will yield a play experience no longer than 45 minutes in length. While the game does feature a survival mode and a 2 through 4 player battle mode, this small diversion that is its primary mode ultimately seems a bit disappointing. Granted, the presentation is second to none, but in the end, do gamers want a pretty technological showpiece or a robust featured filled game? Yo, big ups for using robust there. Unfortunately, the March marketing push did not result in the sales Square were hoping for, and while it's hard to source exact numbers from, you know, 23 years ago, especially in North America, the most common number we have for the bouncer is roughly 350,000 copies in Japan, which was only 5 to 10k more than what Urguys managed to shift a few years earlier. With critical reviews on the lower end of the spectrum, most fans' opinions being split, and this being the latest collaboration between Square and Dream Factory, which ended in a sales disappointment, it's not that surprising that Square never worked with Dream Factory again. However, the tale of Ishii's company doesn't end there. In fact, it only gets more intriguing. Since Dream Factory were obviously talented at pushing hardware, they were then approached by Microsoft, who were of course desperate for Japanese teams to start developing for the Xbox. 
this chance encounter then evolved into Dream Factory putting together an impressive tech demo for the Xbox, which blew Ed Fries's hat clean off his head and resulted in the tech demo turning into the fighting game Kakuto Chojin Back Alley Brutal. To mark this new partnership, Dream Factory changed their name to Dream Publishing in anticipation of all the success they would assuredly have working with Microsoft. That assuredly was in quotations, of course, because when Kakuto Chochin did not sell well in Japan or anywhere really, their partnership with Microsoft promptly dissolved, so they went back to the Dream Factory name and resumed development on the PS2. They wound up teaming with Spike to make Crimson Tears for Capcom, which, to its credit, was a much better mix of an RPG and a beat-em-up. Their last title, however, was 2009's simply titled Toshin Den for the Wii. If you haven't seen my Toshin Den retrospective, then shame on you, but this was an attempt to reboot the Battle Arena Toshin Den franchise, which did no such thing. It's a pretty solid game for what it is, but it again didn't sell very well and was never released outside of Japan. After that, sadly, the story of Dream Factory just sort of ends. Or does it? Yes, it does. But not really, though. Strangely, there was never an announcement of the studio actually closing its doors or even facing bankruptcy. There was just silence. Hell, even Ishii's work history also suddenly stopped. But thanks to the efforts of the Sober Dwarf, linked in the description below, we now know that after nine years of nothing, both he and Dream Factory were credited for developing a mobile version of Namco's Xevious, but in a somewhat stark revelation, Ishii was revealed to be its only employee. The rest of the staff had since moved on, but fortunately, Ishii took this in stride, saying he was happy making smaller titles under his own steam, which, while a commendable attitude, is still a bit depressing considering how integral he was to the success of 3D fighting games. As for Square, or rather now Square Enix, well, they are still putting all their effort into Final Fantasy, and as of this writing, have never re-released the bouncer in any form whatsoever. No PS2 classic digital version, no remaster, just... Yeah, the game apparently just doesn't exist, unless you count that one Dog Street reference in Kingdom Hearts, which I don't. Hell, I mean, they never even attempted to team up with another company to combine beat-em-up gameplay with a movie-style narrative. Yep, that never happened. And if you know of any other rough-and-tumble stories in the video game or movie industries, do let me know in the comments below or enter the dark, hazy bar that is my social medias. See you next time, bouncers, and thanks for watching.